Thank you, everybody, for joining this webinar on administering the vaccines, an optimal mix of professions, settings, and prior priorities to build back better, which is part of our series around the COVID-19 response. And as you have seen in, in some of the other webinars we've been organizing lately, we're now also moving towards not only uh, the, the response itself, but also learning from the response uh, for the future and how we can indeed build back better. My name is Ewout van Ginneken. I'm uh, of the Observatory on Health, Citizens and Policies, and I will be moderating today together with Erica Richardson, my colleague, who will be uh, on screen uh, soon uh, after I finish my uh, introduction. Um, today's webinar, we will focus on administering vaccines and the vaccinations campaigns that are underway in Europe, where all the countries are looking for ways to make up for lost time during the initial rollout. The challenge is to get as many people safely vaccinated as quickly as possible. And the challenge is obviously to do this while maintaining the usual care, the routine primary and specialist services. Uh, as you will see in this webinar, countries are using a variety of, uh, of approaches, and that's what we will focus on today. We're asking ourselves the question, what is the best combination of health workers and settings for which phase of the vaccination campaign? And what lessons uh, can be learned from improved workforce, agility, and a more effective skill mix for the future? Um, we will do this with the following speakers. We will start with Nathan Shufton. Sorry. And Nathan is a research fellow at the Berlin University of Technology. And he studied at the University of Illinois, and he has a master's in public policy from the Hertie School of Governance in Berlin. And Nathan has joined the observatory team in Berlin, and he studied the whole HSRM for all the various responses with regard to the vaccination campaign, and he will give a, a broad overview of this. Then we will move to three uh, spotlight speakers with different countries' perspectives. We will start off with Ruth Weitzberg. Uh, Ruth is a researcher at Myers JDC Brookdale Institute in Jerusalem, but also in the Berlin University of Technology, and she also joined the observatory team over there. And Ruth is already here for, I think, the fourth or the fifth time, so regular viewers know already. She will provide us with a glance from the future because she will give the Israeli perspective. And as you know, they are a bit further ahead in their campaigns and they can give us valuable information um, on what is to be expected. Then we will move to Ingrid Gerlach, who chairs the executive board of the Association of Medical Assistants in Germany. And she will provide us with a very interesting perspective of this perhaps internationally not always that well-known uh, medical profession, but who is, which is in playing an increasingly important role in the, in the vaccine rollout um, in, in Germany. Then I'm also really grateful that we will be joined today by Darach Okiera, who is a professor in primary care in the Department of Public Health and Primary Care in the Trinity College in Dublin. And Darach is also a general practitioner and a partner in a large group practice. So he can give us the perspective of the GP and he's in himself involved in, in this rollout. Darach is also a co-founder of the gpcommunitytracker.com, which is a daily survey of GPs tracking community COVID-19 activity, a sort of a buddy system where they helped identify early changes in disease trends. So he seems to be the right person to talk about the subject of today. But now I will move uh, to my colleague, Erica Richardson, um, who will monitor not only the chat today, but she will also introduce a poll to us so to get uh, your views on a couple of matters of interest. Erica. Thank you very much, Eva. Um, so uh, yes, um, Annalise, if you could launch the poll. This is just a little bit of interaction right at the beginning to uh, see where we all are. Um, and uh, to see um, how you feel about different aspects of some of the things we'll be talking about today. So the first question that we seem to be asking on all the vaccination ones is, have you actually received a COVID-19 vaccination? I've received one, still waiting for my second. Um, so, and the second one is, who would you be happy to get vaccinated by? Uh, because in different countries, it's set up differently. Sometimes it's a GP or family doctor, but often it's been broadened out to other doctors, dentists, nurses, midwives, um, paramedics, 
pharmacists, lay vaccinators, um, or would you not be happy to be vaccinated by any of the above? So we'd be really interested to um, hear your opinions on those things. And I'll give you the results after Nathan's presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's not wait any longer. Uh, Nathan, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Eva, and thank you very much, Erica. And the name of my presentation is Administering COVID-19 Vaccinations, Skills Mixed, and New Approaches. And what I would like to begin with is first just to show the status around Europe uh, of late, this so May 29th, so just a few days ago, of the current vaccination rates in select countries that belong to the WHO European region. The point of showing you this data is not to imply any kind of causal relationships of any countries that we will be discussing today and their specific vaccination rollouts or adjustments of those rollouts, but rather just to provide a brief update uh, in the topic of the day, which is getting people vaccinated as quickly as possible. So the key objective is, again, get, a, get as many as quickly as possibly vaccinated, but also to maintain routine primary and specialist services. The vaccination campaigns have been running since December 2020 throughout the WHO European region and have used a mix of traditional vaccination infrastructures with adjustments, some of them coming early on in the still winter months, some of them coming in the last few months in the spring. In these four following areas, which I will speak a bit more about later, that would be workforce, settings, prioritization groups, and the overall administration and planning. Now, at the beginning of the rollouts in the initial phases, you had two different categorizations for countries around the European region. You had those countries that were relying on their, let's call them traditional infrastructures. So from, <clears throat> excuse me, you would have the uh, physicians and the nurses mainly carrying out those vaccinations. And just a brief overview of a few of the countries that you see highlighted here. But then on the other side of that equation, you had countries that from the initial phase, so already by December 2020, January 2021, they were involving medical personnel or other personnel beyond just physicians and nurses. And I've taken the opportunity just to highlight a few different countries here. The information that I sourced for this all came from either the Health Systems Response Monitor run by the observatory or directly from Ministry of Health websites, which is why, for example, for Denmark, the quote where a doctor is responsible for the vaccinations, but it may be another healthcare professional who vaccinates you. This comes directly from the Danish uh, Min health, Ministry of Health website. Uh, but then you can see around different European countries. Austria, for example, has paramedics and medical students, although under supervision involved. France uh, initially made a move to involve pharmacists, but only for AstraZeneca. Uh, Netherlands had doctor's assistants, although in the presence of a doctor only. And then Latvia, for example, involved retired doctors, physicians assistants, uh, and midwives. Now, when talking about notable changes that have gone on since the initial rollouts, first from workforce, there have been expansions from physicians and nurses in that first group of countries that I showed you uh, two cases of dentists, pharmacists, medical students, paramedics, uh, and, and potential lay personnel in the dimension of settings, primarily from mobile teams that were built to reach elderly or vulnerable or hard to reach populations. And then the larger vaccination centers uh, have since transitioned also to involving GP offices, pop-up vaccination places, companies with company doctors and pharmacies. With prioritizations due to the cases of rare side effects that occur, occur in certain demographics, then some countries wound up changing vaccination prioritizations, especially for AstraZeneca or Johnson & Johnson. That's how I, for example, in Berlin was able to get my first AstraZeneca dose because they lifted the prioritization for that in early May. And I just went around calling random GP offices until I was able to get an appointment. Um, so actually that touches on both settings and prioritizations in terms of a notable change. And then finally, uh, administration, depending on the country, uh, depending on the vaccination, depending on the prioritization group, uh, they spaced out or broadened time between first and second doses. 
And there have also been adjustments to the methods by which people are invited to book appointments uh, varying from country to country. Now to talk about workforce considerations when involving non-traditional or, or, or newer health workforce members that have not been involved in traditional vaccination campaigns, a few things to realize are that there is a role of trust factor. There's a role that uh, credibility plays from the user perspective. Uh, if someone is going to a, get a COVID-19 vaccination and is going to perhaps a, a, a dentist's office to get a vaccination or somewhere that would seem unfamiliar for them or a pop-up center or something like that, then establishing this kind of credibility, particularly with more hesitant or reluctant groups is, is very much of the utmost importance. This kind of user acceptability even plays a bigger role as vaccinations now enter a new phase where the youngest population groups and eventually minors, so those between 12 and 18 years old, will be at some point in line to get vaccinations. Parents are going to have to have that established trust feeling with the person administering the vaccination. Then from the workforce side themselves, there are things like travel times, transport, opening hours of vaccination centers or vaccination locations, and the expected attendance from the workforce to perform those vaccinations that also need to be taken into account to guarantee the existing workforce, their, comfort, their comfortability, their working conditions, um, and to make sure that their health team is properly organized. Then uh, another consideration is the retention of new skills and responsibilities. So now we're in this vaccination campaign, but what does that mean for the future for retaining these certain skills or broadening the skill sets for certain, for certain work groups in the health workforce? Now, as lockdowns end, this will also transition primary and specialist health services and health, health workforce members back to more full-time roles. And I've circled this area here, uh, showing the countries where averages in the European Union are lower than, than the average level for doctors and nurses, not to draw attention that they need to improve this immediately, but as new ideas are considered for skills mixes, that it should be also important to consider what kind of flexibility can be brought, for example, to, to these countries and where can best practices be taken from, from countries that have already used an expanded vaccination workforce. The final thoughts I have here that are as the situation around the WHO European region continues to evolve, Flexibility and responding and adapting timely and creatively to new challenges, whether that was changing the prioritization groups, whether that was temporary pauses on specific vaccines, uh, to make up for lost time, to get a faster pace of vaccination uh, has, has come after alterations to initial rollouts and will continue to be important in terms of those four dimensions of workforce settings, prioritizations and administrations. And this can be also key in cases of stagnant supply, for example, in the European Union countries where they've all gone into a joint procurement together to find creative ways and adaptable ways to get those vaccinations into the arms as quickly as possible. Can countries already begin to incorporate adjustments in those four areas for the need for booster shots that are coming in 2022 and 2023? It's not quite a topic that has been widely discussed in Europe yet, but it is a reality that people and, 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 and health services will have to deal with at some point. So these roles for non-traditional vaccinators or just moving beyond physicians and nurses for additional COVID-19 vaccines, is that something that can be further pursued? And as the primary and specialist health workers shift their focus towards non-COVID treatments and primary care tasks along the idea of build back better, how can we make the best use of health workforce and aim for sustainable practices? And that does it from my side. So I will kick it back. Thank you very much for listening.
Thank you very much, Nathan, for providing such a helpful overview. Um, for those of you looking for even more information, do go to our uh, HSRM website, our uh, Health System Re Response Monitor. But now over to you, Erica. Do we have the results from our poll? I'm curious. Yes, I am too. So, um, oh, I'm glad to say we're up to three quarters of our audience uh, so far have received um, at least part of their COVID-19 vaccination. Um, nearly everyone would be happy to be immunized by a nurse or a GP slash family doctor. No one said none of the above. Um, and uh, pleasing for me is that at least a third of people were happy to be vaccinated by pharmacists or lay vaccinators. So interesting food for thought. Let's find out what's happening in specific countries and see if, see if this is... Uh, um, the one that I find incredibly interesting is that people rather have a lay vaccinator than a dentist give them uh, the shot. So perhaps it's really also fear of the <laughs> dentist that plays a role here that, you know, he will not only give a shot, but also pull the teeth or something. Well, yeah, maybe maybe that's to do with sort of like how scared people are to go to the dentist more generally. But, you know, yeah, it's surprising. Yeah, surprising. Okay. <laughs> well, let's let's go to the future, uh, to to Israel. Ruth, what, what is what is ahead of us? Maybe you can give us a. Uh, some information of the, the Israeli experience. Yes, um, so thank you, Ivald, for inviting me again to talk about uh, the Israeli experience. Um, so yes, the Israeli case, it's a bit different from other countries' experience because uh, the bottleneck over there was actually workforce and not doses of vaccines. Um, and um, you can have more information about this interesting experience from uh, past webinars from uh, April, if I'm not mistaken. You can go back to the website and have a look at the presentation about uh, the Israeli uh, country case. Uh, here, I just want to uh, mention that uh, Israel is uh, indeed ahead of other countries in the vaccination rollout, and it was remarkably fast. And you can see here, um, this is the uh, percentage of vaccinated people among the total population. It's not among those that uh, can receive the vaccine. It includes children. Uh, so you can you have to uh, add another 20% uh, to these numbers to see the real number of vaccinated among those that are eligible. Uh, here, the dots, the, the dotted lines, um, they uh, show the vaccination priority and how it developed really fast. And within less than a month, all age groups were already eligible for the vaccine. We, are, we can also see that within only two weeks of the vaccination rollout, 20% of the population were already vaccinated with one dose. And after two months, it was already 45% of the whole population uh, vaccinated with one dose and another 30% with the second dose. And that meant something like 65% of those aged uh, 16 and over. So the reasons why Israel could vaccinate so fast um, are divided into three uh, components. The first is the availability of the vaccine, and I'm not going to talk about that now, but Israel got enough doses for the whole population early in uh, December and January. And uh, the second element is provision, and this is the topic that I'm going to talk about today. And the third element is compliance, because it's not enough to have the doses and the workforce working on that, you have to have the people willing to come and get the shot. And there is also another webinar on this topic. So those interested on these other two topics can go back. So regarding the vaccination rollout in Israel, since the beginning, the responsibilities of the, vac of the vaccination for each population group were clearly defined. Uh, the general population was under responsibility of the four health plans. Health plans in Israel are competing and national wide, and they, um, they are responsible not only for paying for the health services for the population, but also for providing the services themselves. They usually uh, employ GPs and nurses and contract with uh, specialists, and they purchase hospital services. Uh, for the vaccination campaign, they used mainly the nurses 
that they employ for the rollout. And this is something that was not uh, very difficult because nurses are in general the uh, workforce that do the routine vaccination, for example, flu vaccination uh, during uh, the normal times. For those that live in nursing homes and uh, long-term care uh, institutions, the national emergency services were responsible for the vaccination and they sent paramedics to nursing homes a group of paramedic would come for, to each nursing home and vaccinate everybody at the same time. Regarding frontline health workers, the employers were responsible for the vaccination. Uh, so those that worked in hospitals or health plans were vaccinated by the nurses that work in these institutions. And this is also something that is very common and is done for flu vaccination periodically every year, for example. So it was not something extraordinary. Um, all the soldiers were vaccinated very fast by the army, by the paramedics that work within the army. Uh, there were also some uh, um, initiatives to vaccinate homeless and undocumented workers. And those initiatives were from the Tel Aviv municipality with NGOs and the municipal hospital. They took responsibility and the vaccination were provided by nurses and paramedics that worked in these uh, hospitals and NGOs. And uh, finally, there were some other initiatives to improve, increase the reach out to um, populations that were harder to reach. For example, uh, people that lived in remote areas, the Bedouins in the Negev, in the desert, in the south of the country, or um, uh, small communities in the north of the countries. So mobile vaccination units were sent to these remote areas to uh, improve the access to these populations. And uh, mobile vaccination units uh, have an, an advantage, which is that they can, they, the, the workforce that provide the vaccine is paramedics from the army and from the National um, Emergency Service. And um, these people, they uh, can vaccinate people from um, any health plan. So if a mobile vaccination unit comes to a village, uh, in the desert where um, Bedouins live, they can vaccinate the entire village regardless where these uh, people uh, are members from each what uh, health plan. So it was an advantage in this sense. Um, now I'm gonna talk a little longer about the general population and the health plans because uh, in Israel, as I told, the nurses are authorized to vaccinate without the physicians being present. But the problem is that Israel has very, very few nurse or nurses per population. It's uh, five per 100,000 compared to the OECD average of 8.8. .8. So what happened was that because most of outpatient nurses are employed by the health plans, uh, they could be rapidly deployed from their other tasks. From, for example, from their primary care uh, services or um, um, infant immunization services, and they were sent to work in these vaccination centers uh, for very long hours. They worked after hours, they worked like crazy, really, because you can imagine that vaccinating 20% of the population in two weeks wasn't for free. So it was very effective on the short time, and it's sustainable for one or two months, but for the long run, it's not that good to have all these nurses uh, working only on vaccination for COVID and uh, leaving out their regular work uh, of primary care. So countries that plan this rollout have to be careful not to neglect the other prioritizations and other services that are important on a routine basis. Um, and finally, another uh, initiative that Israel had was to send the mobile units, mobile vaccination units to places uh, where um, the hesitant would go. So for example, university campus um, and the, the market, you can see here pictures of a mobile vaccination unit in a market in Jerusalem or in the beach in Tel Aviv or in a, a Bedouin village in the south. And uh, this was very effective because uh, if the young wouldn't come to the clinics of the health plans to get the vaccine, the vaccine went to where they go to get them get the shot. And 
again, it was an advantage because uh, then members from any health plan could be vaccinated in these uh, mobile units and uh, paramedics would uh, provide the shot and uh, uh, without um, undermining the primary care services that nurses had to be doing. So um, I think that this is it for from Israel. And if you are interested, um, you can go back to other webinars and thank you for the attention. I think I'm going to go back to you, Evald. Thank you very much, Ruth, for this perspective. I think our seminar where we discuss the, the rollout in full, was it, I think it was in March, So, but you can find it indeed back uh, on our website very easily. Um, so let's move to Germany. Ingrid. Um, I'm an executive chairman of the Association of Medical Assistants and there um, gives uh, about 600,000 in Germany. Please. So, um, Germany set up vaccination centers at the beginning at the vaccination campaign. Um, citizens should register only via online platforms uh, in order to uh, receive a vaccination appointment. Um, this should be also by via phone. Doctors were recruited for the vaccination centers as well as medical assistant, nurses, and paramedics. After a long and unsuccessful search, state and regional politicians um, uh, become to our association and asked for help. We conducted the medical associations to start a joint campaign and have great success. So, what is to do in the vaccination centers? Medical assistants take care of the preparation, mostly the vaccination itself and the observation of the vaccinated citizens. The doctor conducted the informative discussion with the citizens because only he is legally allowed to do this in Germany. And he signs the vaccination certification. In the vaccination centers, they are run by subcontractors. They make fee contracts for emergency services. And there are large regional differences in pay. And most of them are not covered by social security. That's not good. In GP practices and specialist practices, Medical assistants do classificating uh, according to priority groups is carried out by the medical assistant on the base of our um, practice software where existing diagnosis. The organization, such as for example, information about vaccination, ordering vaccination doses from the pharmacy, calling patients to clarify appointments, the special organization and the necessary hygienic devices, the vaccination is carried out by our medical assistant. Also here, doctors conduct the informative discussion and sign the vaccination certificate. So, Vaccinations may legally only be carried out by medical assistant in the presence of a doctor. In the reality, like qualified colleagues who visit patients uh, in the home of them often do this when instructed to the doctor in a qualified manner, but it isn't allowed. Also change dosage, evaluation of the ECG and laboratory analysis. We do this, but it isn't allowed. In these cases, the doctor bears a legal liability. This is a question of trust between the doctor and the medical assistant, but it will not be made public. The perspective. Medical assistants can do much more. The organization of the network and the interprofessional cooperation is already the task today. In the future, all administrative tasks, 
physical examination of the patient, uh, report preparation, inquiring and taking over routine examinations can be carried out independently after appropriate training. What we need is recognition of our competences and changes in legal requirements. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ingrid. Um, such an interesting story. So I'm really curious also what Darag will have to say about Ireland because he, he will have the GP perspective. And I'm really curious to hear also from him how much of an extra burden uh, the delivery of vaccines is currently in his practice and, and in Ireland in general. So uh, Darag, the floor is yours. Um, so um, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, present in terms of uh, Ireland's vaccine rollout to date. Um, we have approaching 50% uh, of the uh, adult uh, population uh, vaccinated. Um, the health service has been struck by a uh, ransomware attack, a very serious one, um, but we have been able to manage to continue uh, with our uh, vaccination process. Um, we are achieving uh, good uh, rates um, as we are progressing down uh, through uh, the age groups. So um, for example, in the 85 uh, plus category, 98% uh, of the population have received their first dose and 88% uh, percent, uh, are fully uh, vaccinated. And we're seeing uh, the benefit of that in terms of reduced morbidity and mortality in these age groups. In terms of locations, the key locations um, uh, for vaccine uh, were the public hospitals uh, at the beginning of the campaign, uh, but more recently, it's a 50-50 uh, split between GP practices and mass vaccination uh, centres. The central coordination uh, has been quite good, so there has been a national COVID-19 vaccination strategy via the health service executive that really has coordinated all the different uh, components uh, of uh, our, our vaccine rollout. All vaccinators have to complete uh, online modules which are provided by the health service executive and uh, these cover all aspects of uh, COVID vaccine information and it's a prerequisite uh, for state indemnification uh, for uh, participating uh, vaccinators. In terms of the delivery, um, at the beginning, frontline healthcare workers, those working in secondary care, uh, were the first cohorts to be vaccinated. And many uh, doctors and nurses in hospitals trained to do peer vaccination uh, of each other and also the uh, National Ambulance uh, Service uh, assisted particularly uh, when vaccinated uh, general uh, practitioners and general practice nurses. Um, very high risk patients and high risk patients were identified from the electronic uh, practice records in both general practice and uh, in secondary care. Um, and so GP uh, and uh, GP practice nurses uh, have been involved uh, in vaccinating this cohort, either in their own practices uh, or in, in mass vaccination clinics. And the other state run or state organized mass, va mass vaccination uh, clinics um, in terms of vaccinators are mainly staffed with community nurses and, and other healthcare professionals. Uh, there was a big campaign then to vaccinate our over 70s cohort. Um, so this was done uh, through the GP uh, practice network. For patients up to 69, we now have a national registration portal. Um, so uh, again, using age-based cohorts, so any citizens can um, uh, register on this portal and will be called for vaccination in a mass centre, usually within uh, one week. Housebound patients uh, have been vaccinated by members of the ambulance service. Uh, specific uh, vulnerable groups have been targeted by public health and NGOs. There has been a recruitment campaign uh, to staff uh, the mass vaccination centres. 
So of interest, the approved professions to work in these mass uh, vaccination centres also include pharmacists, physiotherapists, uh, emergency medical technicians and paramedics, dentists, optometrists, radiographers, radiation therapists and dental hygienists. Um, we expect within uh, one month uh, that community uh, pharmacies will also be utilised uh, to roll out the uh, to, to to roll out the vaccine. So this will be uh, particularly uh, useful uh, in areas where there um, are not very many um, mass vaccination centres. The GP experience. Um, so there are 1,400 uh, practices nationwide. So uh, GP practices are independent entities uh, with both state contracts and private revenue. The vaccines are received on a fortnightly basis through our standard cold chain infrastructure. We make a request for a specific number of doses in advance, depending on which group uh, we are vaccinating. Um, and again, we use our electronic patient record to identify these patients. So a very typical amount might be that you might get a, a delivery of 200 doses. We uh, contact patients and deliver, uh, give them pre-allocated appointments. So our own clinic, uh, if we are vaccinating, it's staffed by uh, three to four GPs and one practice nurse. And the work is divided. So all uh, either GP or practice nurse will do will, will do the consenting and the, the, the vaccination. There's, there's no distinction. Um, we think that there's a high uptake and uh, satisfaction, and I think uh, trust is, is very important. So uh, general practitioners are very much trusted uh, by the public. Of course, there is the issue of non-COVID uh, work uh, displacement, um, but having the fortnightly uh, delivery of vaccines, I think helps um, normal business to be conducted uh, on the, the, the other days. Uh, there is a, a remuneration for the state, uh, so a two-dose uh, course of vaccination will result in a €60 euro payment uh, to the practice. Um, the response has been typified by strong leadership from a GP union and GP college who have engaged um, very productively, very proactively uh, with the health authorities. And indeed, the first iteration of the mass vaccination clinics were GP led and these were to cater for the rollout of vaccines to the over 70s patients in smaller practices who may not have had the infrastructure to run their own clinic. So there are GP led uh, mass vaccination clinics catering for three, four uh, thousand uh, patients uh, per day. So that concludes my uh, summary of the, the Irish experience of us. Thank you very much, Darach. Very interesting. I already have a few questions for you, um, but let's first go to Erica and see what kind of questions she collected from the viewers. Okay, yes. Thank you very much. Some interesting uh, questions coming up, uh, some more specific, some more general. Um, but on the more specific ones, if we start with those, uh, one for Ingrid on uh, should physicians assistants be working more independently? Uh, do you think that's something that we, you know, when it comes to sort of building back, back better, is that something that Germany could be looking to develop? Um, one quite specific, well, it was it was directed at uh, um, Ireland, but I think we could. It's also relevant to Israel. It's how do you come overcome the issue of low storage temperature for the Pfizer vaccine when you are administering it in GPs practices? or actually in mobile units? How, how do you overcome the logistics when you've got to store it at such low temperatures? Um, and um, how have the actual settings changed for vaccination? We've, we've looked very much at the uh, who's administering the vaccines, but how have the settings changed as well to reach uh, wider into the population? Um, and then I suppose the big question is, um, how can we mitigate against the uh, well, the opportunity costs, uh, to, use a, to use an inappropriate uh, term, but um, how, how can we best maintain non-COVID services whilst we're rolling out our uh, universal vaccination campaigns? Okay. okay. Sh shall we start with Ingrid then, uh, with a very specific question about your uh, profession and 
Um, the question whether you think you should have more authority to do this independently and how should this be organized? So, uh, physician assistant, uh, we haven't enough in Germany. Um, and also they, they work in hospitals, not in uh, uh, GP practices. Uh, so, um, our professional had uh, the possibility to, to do um, physician assistant um, to learning. Um, but for this moment, we haven't enough. And our profession, the medical assistants, do this for decades. And, and they uh, know what they do. So in the future, yes, we can physician assistants included in general practitioners uh, working. I mean, then I would like to go to uh, Darach and also, how, how did you see this? I mean, you have been sharing this workload, this extra workload also with your physician nurse. You have been uh, administering vaccines. Are you open to other professions? Do you think that's helpful also in light of uh, perhaps booster shots in the future? Yes, Eva, absolutely. I, I think it has, um, it has shown us actually that uh, speed is the, the the key to success, and I think we actually have to uh, use whatever resources are available. So actually, I think I mentioned this uh, online uh, training uh, module that was made available to to, to vaccinators. So that allows kind of a, a standard uh, in in some ways, um, and I think if there is appropriate supervision, um, I, I'm I'm very much open to to expanding. Uh, the roles that, that can vaccinate, absolutely. Could you, could you say that it also affected your workload? I mean, was it more difficult for you to do routine care and you and your team? Yeah, on, on the days uh, that we were vaccinating, that's all you're doing. You, you might have one doctor operating kind of an emergency uh, phone line. Um, and so a 200 dose delivery, you might do it in one day, you might spread it over two days. Um, so um, yeah, it, it does it does pose some limitations. Um, so yeah, so as much help uh, as as possible, really. Um, I, I think if, if you just have to have a responsible person at each each site, you know, and and to make sure that everybody has you know done the the standard uh, training and upskilling uh, that they need to do. Thanks. So Ruth, perhaps you can answer the, the cold storage question, and maybe Darach can also add to that. How did you organize this? Yes, but can I first uh, say something related the, to the previous question about yes. uh, how to maintain the primary care uh, yeah. services? So, for example, in Israel, the, the uh, very fast vaccination phase of the rollout were uh, the first two months, maybe the first three months. And during these two, three months, nurses were mainly providing the shots. But after that, they came back to their uh, um, original roles and they were also giving the, the COVID vaccination. So I think it's a matter of a balance of how long you deploy the, the, the uh, caregivers to give the vaccine and uh, how long you just add this on top of their regular work. And if it's a very fast vaccination rollout as in Israel, I think it would probably be okay to leave uh, uh, the primary care services on hold for two months or three, but maybe longer than that, it would be, uh, maybe it would have uh, more disadvantages. Um, but uh, regarding the low temperatures of uh, mobile units and the primary care clinics, in Israel, the health plans, they own many, many primary care clinics. It's not that it, there are independent practices like here in Germany, for example. So they have big primary care clinics uh, all over the country. And these clinics, they do have cooling systems that can uh, store the vaccine. They also have um, their logistics um, cooling systems uh, in uh, certain areas, for example, in, in the center of the country. And because the country is very small, it's easy to carry the vaccine on the same day from the uh, um, logistics mm -hmm. center or from a big uh, primary care clinic in a big city to a remote uh, village. So actually it's a, an advantage of a small country, but also the fact that the health plans own these primary care clinics and they have big clinics in many, many cities. 
Um, and actually, um, the very small primary care practices that are independent, they received on a daily basis. They didn't store themselves. I also think that there were some changes made in the requirements for storage. Perhaps, Darach, you, you know about this? Uh, how, or how do you do it in, in, in Ireland? Yeah. So uh, in, in Ireland, uh, we, th there is good infrastructure uh, already in terms of cold chain uh, because of childhood immunization. So, so these, these pipelines are there. So, um, uh, so the way uh, we basically were mandated to, to use um, the, uh, the, the Pfizer vaccine uh, within uh, five days of receipt, within 120 hours, and then within uh, two hours of a vial uh, being opened. So we were able to uh, store them uh, in, in our own uh, fridges for a, a short period of time. Um, so that, that's been uh, extended, uh, that period of time has now been extended for up to a month. Um, so, uh, but it's dependent on that infrastructure already being there in terms of a cold chain supply, uh, in this case for childhood immunizations to the practices. Erica, we had one also broader question. Was it the one about settings? Um, yes, yes. But shall I shall I just do a bit of a roundup yes. of the last mop up the last few questions? So, you know, so one is how the settings have changed. But um, I think, you know, looking to the future, um, what should we be doing now to plan for potential COVID nineteen vaccine booster shots and the organisation of care? For, um, around uh, vac vaccine booster shots. Um, and what have been the barriers, again, with the sort of skill mixing, what have been the barriers to getting professionals outside primary care involved in the vaccination program? And has there been any resistance from patients to the, you have a wider range of professionals as vaccinators, so for example, dentists. Has there been any sort of like resistance that people have, uh, are aware of that, or have come across? Um, and then I've got one more question, which is, is more for me, which is what is the main thing that uh, you think we should be keeping? So what's the main thing that we've learned from the, the okay. COVID-19 vaccination campaign that we want to continue into the future? So there you go. Let's ask our spotlight speakers, but perhaps first we ask Nathan also, because we're already now post-pandemic all of a sudden, we're, we're still uh, vaccinating in this you know, current wave. And Nathan, what, what were the, shifting, the shifts that you've been seeing across Europe um, in terms of uh, settings? Sure. And then, then um, yeah. yeah, yeah. The, the first thing, as, as you just mentioned, everybody's thinking in this sort of post-COVID, everybody's getting a vaccination, it's all going to be over, lockdowns are, are being loosened now, rightfully so. But even if people get fully vaccinated, as much as everybody would like to think it, as much as shop owners or government health officials or just us as regular people, it's, it's not over. And governments and planning services also need to be prepared for that in the next coming months. Uh, the European Commission has procured something like 4.4 billion doses of COVID-19 vaccines. And what's going to be really important to pair alongside that is communication, not only that booster shots are going to be a reality, but also in terms of potentially building up the options for lay vaccinators or non-traditional vaccinators to prepare people just mentally for the prospect that they could in the future in 2022 or 2023 be getting a dose from somebody that they wouldn't traditionally think would be giving them that dose. And that's all about establishing that trust and that credibility that I mentioned during my presentation. The other thing is that where, as, as getting back to the other question was about the settings, how have they changed? Well, you go from the mobile vaccination teams and the, the big vaccination centers, and then you go into different areas such as GP offices, but we've heard from Darach how that has its own difficulties in terms of managing primary care services. And so maybe there's a role for other options there in the future. The big lesson, I guess, uh, the huge takeaway is that even as much planning as uh, a health ministry or a, a COVID task force can do, there's always going to be hiccups along the way. So keeping open ears and open eyes for everything on how to adjust in the middle of something, which we've seen in many cases is a huge takeaway. 
Thanks, Nathan. So maybe Ingrid, uh, you can answer Erica's question about how should we prepare ourselves for the the the, the you know the booster shots, and what are the changes that we should retain? So, um, uh, to involve GPs and specialists from the from the beginning, and mm -hmm. not after four or five months. Um, uh, since GPs um, vaccinate, the, the um, vaccination daily number has tripled. And so what, why do we, um, the centers, I know it. So. Clear. Okay. Um, Dara, you probably agree with that. <laughs> I absolutely agree with that. And, no. Um, no, I, I do. Uh, and as I said, at the moment, so the interesting thing for me is that actually I, I was taken, uh, taken aback actually by how much the, 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 the GP uh, community actually put their hands up to help and actually made it their business to to have very very high level meetings uh, with the, the the health authorities and gave example in terms of running their own mass vaccination clinics at the start so my advice really is that i agree with ingrid i think general practice actually has a huge amount to offer and actually you know in each country you sh should put their best foot forward and be confident and say well actually i think we can make a really important contribution and as you go into the, the booster phase so trust and convenience are so important and actually i would envisage in the in the booster phase that actually you know the, our, our nurse will be able to do the vast majority of the vaccinations on a, on a more piecemeal uh basis you know um so i think a semblance of of normality will come back to to to, to primary care in that context thank you ruth Yes. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add that besides specialists and uh, GPs, nurses are a big workforce that can be very helpful. And as I told in Israel, they are the main workforce providing the vaccines and it can be another group of uh, um, providers that uh, the work workforce that give the shot. Regarding the future, well, in Israel, they have already been planning the future, the boost, because they have already vaccinated everybody that wanted to get the vaccine. And now the plan is to keep the vaccines uh, under responsibility of the four health plans. And uh, these would be added to the routine vaccinations provided by nurses, like the flu vaccination. So this is something that is going to remain uh, like that. And it's not going to be under the responsibility of the public health services, for example. It's going to be it's going to remain in the primary care service. Um, and the main takeaway for Israel is that um, they should train more nurses. The shortage of nurses is a well-known problem for many years already, and there have been a lot of initiatives to try to increase the training and, and uh, the workforce uh, of nurses. Um, and I think that this is um, something that COVID has highlighted even more. Thank you very much, Ruth. Um, I think it's time for us to start wrapping up now. What we normally always do is we ask the overview keynote speaker, that would be you, Nathan, to give his or her takeaway, in this case, his takeaway uh, lessons from today's session. And I think you already gave a few of them just uh, a few minutes ago. Um, but perhaps what are your thoughts um, after hearing all the other more country-based perspectives? Definitely uh, from, from hearing from Ireland, Israel, and Germany, and how we move towards the future on this stuff, it's the most important that the, the health workforce themselves get a say in the matter and that they have a seat at the so-called table when these new decisions get developed and not just hear about them from a press release or immediately when they're when they're made open to the public and then they have to find out how to cope immediately with these new changes and they get bombarded with phone calls and contacts and emails and things like that. So 
workforce participation in the policy development process, I think, is is also something to uh, to take away from what our our three spotlight speakers have said. Yeah, I think also the message that primary care should be involved from the beginning. I mean, your experiences from Germany and Ireland is something we see in many other countries as well, and often. The sector, the GPs, advocating themselves, as you said, uh, Darach, that you said, we, we want to play a role here. We can help. Let us help. And we know our people. We know who's vulnerable. Let's not make that mistake again. I think that is a very clear lesson uh, coming out of uh, today's webinar. Um, with that, I would like to uh, thank uh, our uh, speakers of today for their incredibly valuable uh, insights. And I hope that I'll see all of you back next week. Erica, do we know what we're talking about next week? Yes, indeed. Next week, it's all about accessing hard to reach groups as part of the vaccination campaign. So marginalized groups, marginalized communities. Um, so it's going to be it's a really hot topic, really interesting topic. Um, and yeah, we started I already a little bit discussing that today, but uh, it's good that we have a, yeah. a, no, a so dedicated it's... session today because we're not there yet. We still need to reach those groups. Oh, perhaps, you know, some of you can join again. Um, yeah. Okay, so th thanks everybody for, uh, for, for viewing and we really hope to see you back next week. Um, please also fill out the evaluation form. I think you get a pop-up when, uh, when the, the session is closed. We really appreciate it and we can also use it to improve the content and the structures of our, our series. So with that, I hope everybody stay safe and I hope to see you next week. Bye-bye.